Hello everyone and welcome to Mox's webinar, Wireless Reliability, What You Need to Know for the Best Connection. I'm Martin McHugh and I'll be your moderator today. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please use the questions pane by simply typing in your question and clicking send. At the end of the presentation, we'll do a Q&A session and take as many questions as we have time for. We will follow up with all unanswered questions after the webinar. Today's presentation will be around 30 to 40 minutes with an additional 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. Okay, let's get started. Today's presenter is Ariana Drivdahl. Ariana is the Product Marketing Manager for the Industrial Wireless Group here at Moxa. She possesses a wealth of knowledge when it comes to cellular and wireless technologies and understanding how to specify and deploy them within your network or system. With that, I'll hand it over to Ariana to get things started. Thanks, Marty, and hello, everyone. Thanks for attending our webinar today. As Marty mentioned, my name is Ariana Drivdahl, and uh, I'll be happy to be your presenter today. So we're going to cover a few different topics during our webinar today. Um, first, we're going to do a brief introduction to the various uh, wireless technologies that you may see in industrial environments. Uh, next, we're going to go ahead and cover a few market trends. Uh, then we're going to talk about, you know, what are some of the concerns that you may have about deploying wireless in harsh environments? And then finally, how to make your wireless reliable, uh, excuse me, more reliable in those harsh environments. Now, when we talk about uh, industrial wireless or industrial communication protocols, there are basically three categories or three types of networks that we refer to. Uh, the first one is considered to be a WPAN, which is a wireless personal area network. This includes such things as Bluetooth, Zigbee, and infrared networking. Then we move into a slightly larger coverage area, which is considered to be a WLAN or wireless local area network. This includes primarily the 802.11 or Wi-Fi family of protocols. Finally, when we go into an ever-increasing size of coverage, we go into the WAN or the Wide Area Network. Um, this primarily includes such things as cellular, but can also include things like 900 megahertz. Now, Bluetooth is a wireless protocol that um, we see quite a bit in consumer or commercial type ap applications. I'm sure all of you have cell phones that have Bluetooth enabled. Many of you probably have laptops um, that are Bluetooth enabled, cars that are Bluetooth enabled. Um, the reason that that's chosen for those types of applications is because Bluetooth is a very good, very efficient short range communication technology. Um, it does use however, 2.4 to 2.48 gigahertz in terms of its communication frequency. Um, and this can sometimes cause problems with Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi can also transmit in that same frequency. Now, one of both the benefits and downfalls of Bluetooth is that the range of this technology is typically limited to around 30 feet, um, maybe a little bit more. It can also be a little bit less depending on the, um, the situation and kind of the environment. Um, Bluetooth is one that's, you know, used occasionally in industrial environments, but is used a lot less frequently than some other personal area network technologies in industrial environments. Um, just because it has a very short communication distance, but it's also pretty susceptible to interference. And that's something that typically we try to avoid when talking about an industrial environment. Now, Zigbee is also considered to be a personal area network with a very similar range to Bluetooth. However, Zigbee is seen a lot more in industrial environments just because it's a little bit of a hardier protocol. So it, it tends to you know, not be as susceptible to interference, and it tends to be a little bit more of a reliable communication method. So you typically see Zigbee um, in circumstances where you have a grouping of devices that are in pretty close proximity that all need to get tied back to you know, perhaps a greater um, Wi-Fi network, for example example. Um, so typically, you know, those devices will have some sort of a Zigbee um, adapter or Zigbee, you know, device onto it, and um, they'll all communicate back to a Zigbee master, which would then connect back to, you know, your main uh, wireless network as a whole. Now, Zigbee is becoming increasingly popular because not only is it um, very low powered, uh, which means that its power requirements are very minimal, but it also uses what we call a mesh network topology which means that uh, every node in a Zigbee network doesn't necessarily need to see the master node. As long as they can see another node within the Zigbee network, it will be able to basically hop through that other device to get to the master. Um, so in this sense, it's great because you don't necessarily need line of sight uh, in order to be able to communicate with Zigbee. So Zigbee, as I mentioned, is probably the most popular personal area network when it comes to industrial communication. 
Now there's a few things to know. Um, it does use different frequencies depending on where you are in the world. Europe uses 868 megahertz. Uh, here in the good old US of A, we use 900 megahertz, um, as does Australia. And the one thing to be aware of is that in most other countries in the world, Zigbee actually operates on 2.4 gigahertz. And um, if you have any devices uh, or machines that you ship overseas, it is something to be aware of that that 2.4 gigahertz operating frequency can, in fact, impact some traditional Wi-Fi networks as well. 900 megahertz is uh, another very popular communication protocol. Um, 900 megahertz um, is a very long distance communication method. Uh, when we talk about wireless technologies, typically we have an inverse relationship between frequency and distance. What this means is that the lower the frequency, the longer the range of that wireless network is going to be. Uh, so 900 megahertz, because the frequency is significantly lower than Wi-Fi, which operates at either 2.4 or 5 gigahertz, uh, means it can go a lot further. And so there are, you know, installations of 900 megahertz that can go uh, 20, 30, 50, even farther, um, excuse me, 50 miles or even further. And, um, you know, typically the bandwidth that's associated with these point-to-point -point radios is very minimal. However, um, there are some manufacturers who uh, lately have basically come out with a hybrid of Wi-Fi and 900 megahertz that really allows kind of a sweet spot. And, um, you know, that sweet spot allows you to go up to, um, you know, 15 to 30 kilometers while still maintaining a pretty strong um, 6 to 10 megabit per second throughput. So 900 megahertz is evolving um, very rapidly and um, typically it's used as a backhaul that will connect to a local Wi-Fi network. Um, however, with some of the new technology that's um, you know, being um, brought out, uh, there, it is also now starting to become used as a traditional Wi-Fi replacement within a very noisy or very uh, dirty environment. Now, Wi-Fi is um, pretty much the most popular consumer and industrial communication technology. Um, you know, there are many different standards of Wi-Fi. Um, I'll kind of go through some of them in just a few minutes here. Um, but, you know, it's important to note that some are backwards compatible with others and some are not. And so it's really important to know if you do decide to implement Wi-Fi to really familiarize yourself with the different types of, you know, wireless, um, wireless protocols to see which one is going to be right for your application. Now, uh, which technologies are the most popular? So as I mentioned in the a few of the previous slides, in the industrial space, you know, there's really two that are the, the biggest, and those are truly Wi-Fi and cellular communication. Um, you know, the reason for this is you know, not only are they fairly robust communication methods, but they're very widely available. You know, you'll find almost nobody that doesn't have either a cellular connected device or a Wi-Fi connected device, and that makes you know the that makes the spread of these two devices into the industrial space very very popular. If you're trying to go long distance or bridge to distant locations together, 900 megahertz is the one that's been used, you know, traditionally in the past as being the most suitable for that kind of long backhaul communication. Now, one of the things that we've been seeing lately is a, is a trend of basically the convergence of different types of networks. So in this type of you know, network, what we're talking about is perhaps you have two locations, perhaps two water or wastewater facilities, and they may be 15 miles away. And um, what, what people have been starting to do is they'll use a 900 link 900 megahertz link to go between those two locations. At those locations, they may have a you know Wi-Fi network that serves that location as a whole, and then they may have some smaller devices, perhaps sensors on the water tanks, uh, that will connect back to a master sensor via Zigbee. So you know we're really starting to see a really large convergence of many different types of networks, and you know with everything going into more of an Ethernet based as opposed to a serial based uh, medium, this is definitely possible because you no longer have to worry about having any kind of of particular protocols running across your network that maybe aren't compatible with some of the, wi the wireless mediums. So um, we're going to start our first poll here. Um, I'm going to have a couple of these for you guys today. Um, curious to know, you know, what uh, wireless technology are you currently using? Um, are you using Wi-Fi, cellular, uh, local area, something like a Bluetooth or a Zigbee, 900 megahertz, or I'm still looking at going into wireless? And we'll give you guys just a, a few seconds to answer that. It looks like some answers are coming through. Uh, the vast majority of you guys so far are using Wi-Fi, um, which certainly isn't surprising given the uh, popularity of it in both the industrial and the consumer space. 
Um, so we'll give just a few more seconds here. Oh, looks like cellular 900 megahertz are starting to kind of pull up a little bit. Um, all right, so thanks you guys for participating in that. So as you can see here, Wi-Fi by and large is the one that you guys have been using the most. 64% uh, of you said Wi-Fi is you know what you're currently using. Uh, coming up second is cellular, and a close third to that is um, is 900 megahertz, and then followed a distant fourth by Zigbee. Um, and it looks like about 7% of you are just looking into getting into going wireless. So thanks guys for participating. So, uh, which technology is right for me? Well, uh, the type of technology that you want to use for your application is really going to be dependent on, you know, what, what type or how far you want your application to go. So, we try to categorize them into basically two. Uh, one of them is a wide type of a topology, um, and what we, what we call that one is, is one that's really widely distributed or long distance. So, this can be uh, citywide, all the way up to nationwide, even on a global scale. Um, so, for example, if you have, you know, a device in China that you need to communicate with a control center here in the U.S., we would consider that to be, obviously, a wide network. Now, the other one would be something like a WLAN um, or, a, or a local network, and um, those would be ones that are either fast-moving, requiring some sort of a fast-roaming technology, which is something that many Wi-Fi devices feature, um, or if you need a very high throughput. Uh, with the advent of 802.11n and the upcoming uh, ratification of 802.11ac, um, it's now possible to have you know, very high speeds across your wireless network, almost approaching that what you would find in a traditional uh, local network. So, if your application is going to be wide-based, um, you're going to want to look at either cellular technology or 900 megahertz. And uh, if your application is WLAN or locally based, you're going to want to look to Wi-Fi uh, or potentially 900 megahertz. Now, the bulk of this uh, webinar is going to focus on both cellular and Wi-Fi since those are the two most popular standards, and it looks like those are the two that you guys have been using the most as well, so that kind of jives with that um, also. Now, 80211 Alphabet Soup, as I mentioned, there are several different uh, communication protocols within the 80211 family. And um, there are, even though the, the three older ones, 80211A, B, and G, were ratified many years ago, they're still very, very prevalent today, um, more so in the industrial space than the consumer space, where people are migrating a little bit more towards 80211N. But um, the 80211A, B, G family is still very, very popular in the industrial space, um, primarily because it's very well known, it's very reliable, you know, people kind of know what they're getting into when talking about those three different protocols, um, but also in the industrial space there tends to be, with the exception of video of course, uh, much lower uh, bandwidth requirements than consumers. So as we all know, when we go home we like to surf the net, we like to stream video, stream music, all those things require a very high bandwidth. However, within the industrial space that's not something that is, you know, really prevalent yet at this point. Um, as I mentioned, video over wireless is the exception to that rule. Now, 802.11b and 802.11g uh, operate on 2.4 gigahertz, so those are the two protocols that are going to have the most issues with interference. Uh, that could be interference from things like, you know, Bluetooth or Zigbee or, or any other kind of, you know, wireless network that's operating at 2.4, but they can also be interfered by um, basically noise in the air, and that could come from things like microwave ovens, um, you know, e even even machinery noise, things that you wouldn't normally um, associate with, you know, having an impact on wireless networks. Now, 802.11a operates on the 5 gigahertz spectrum, and um, it's a lot less susceptible to interference. There's a lot less of it on 5 gigahertz. However, the higher communication frequency um, makes it so that it will not travel as far as the 2.4 will. So there's kind of a trade-off, if you will, between uh, distance and reliability. Now, 802.11n is kind of a hybrid, if you will, of all three of those. So the protocol itself is backwards compatible to both uh, 802.11a as well as b and g. Uh, however, you do typically need to select which frequency um, you'll have to go back to. So uh, 802.11n, as it stands by itself, um, will not uh, go back to both at the same time. You will have to select which backwards compatibility you basically want to have. Now, some of the advantages and uh, disadvantages of 802.11b and G, um, the advantages are they're very widely used. There is almost no wireless device in the market today that does not support either 802.11b or 802.11g. 
Um, there's also a very good backwards compatibility with that family of protocols. So 802.11n is backwards compatible to G, which is backwards, compatibility, backwards compatible to B as well. Um, and again, that longer communication distance um, because of that, excuse me, 2.4 gigahertz frequency. Now the disadvantages, as I mentioned, um, it is very susceptible to interference, um, not only with the number of devices communicating on the 2.4 gigahertz bands, uh, like I mentioned, personal area networks, um, cordless phones, other Wi-Fi, um, you know, there's a reason that uh, these are the most popular wireless standards today, it's because everybody uses them, but that can also be its downfall because of that interference aspect. Um, also, there are overlapping channels that exist within the 2.4 gigahertz band, um, meaning if you use two channels that are adjacent to each other, uh, they can actually interfere with each other. So you can see here, this picture on the bottom is essentially the, um, the, the spectrum mapped out, if you will, for 802.11b and 802.11g. So you can see those adjacent channels. Now there are three channels um, within the 2.4 gigahertz space that are not overlapping, and those are channels 1, 6, and 11. And uh, those are the three that are typically recommended for use if you are using one of those two protocols. Now, 802.11b um, is the slowest. It has a rated bandwidth of only up to about 11 megabits per second. So this is typically only used if you have a device that, um, you know, really doesn't have the ability to go into an 802.11g or an 802.11n network. Um, 802.11g, on the other hand, um, does have the capability of going up to 54 megabits per second. So it's significantly faster than 802.11b is. Now, 802.11a, as I mentioned, is the wireless protocol that operates on 5 gigahertz. Uh, the advantage of this is that it's a lot less susceptible to interference. Um, not only is the protocol itself a little bit more hardy in terms of interference resistance, but there are also a lot fewer devices that communicate in the 5 gigahertz band. Uh, the other nice thing about 802.11a is that all the channels within the space are non-overlapping, which means that you can use adjacent channels without a problem and without worrying about them interfering with each other. Um, and there are some channels that uh, you can actually have at a higher power. And what that means is that you can transmit a little bit farther on some of those channels. Now the disadvantages of 802.11a are that it's a much shorter communication distance and it's also not compatible with 802.11b or 802.11g. So if you want to um, you know, have a wireless network, you have to kind of pick one or the other. Um, you can't use them both at the same time, unfortunately. Now this is what the uh, spectrum looks like for 802.11a. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, there are some higher frequency bands. Um, the one thing to be aware of with 802.11a is that some of the channels in the UNI2 and the UNI3 bands are also the same frequencies that are used for radar. So if you want to use some of those higher frequency bands, you have to make sure that the device you are choosing is going to support DFS. And what that does is it makes sure that that wireless device um, basically scans the air and sees if there is radar in its presence. And if there is, ensures that it's not transmitting on the same frequency as the radar is because um, obviously that can be very problematic if you uh, interfered with any kind of radar communication. So that's just kind of the one special note um, to be aware of when we're talking about 802.11a and some of those upper channels. Now, 802.11n is um, the latest ratified standard. Of course, there is 802.11ac, but that has not been fully ratified at this point. Um, 802.11n was ratified in October of 2009, and it was really um, created to address a couple of things. You know, people were clamoring for the farther distances that they wanted their wireless networks to go, but they also wanted Wi-Fi to start kind of catching up to, you know, what, what the speeds of what wired networks are able to accomplish. So um, 802.11n has speeds of up to 300 megabits per second, and it does work with gigabit ethernet. So most of the devices that you see nowadays that support 802.11n will also come with gigabit ethernet ports. And that's just to make sure that um, you know, there's no backlog on the wired side as opposed to the wired side, which you know, most people kind of laugh at when you say like, oh, the, the backlog would be on the wired side. But it's true, if you do only have a 10100 port on your 802.11n devices, um, there will actually be a backlog on the wired side. 
Now, some of the advantages and disadvantages to 802.11n, um, it does have the ability to communicate backwards to all three of those older 802.11 standards. Now, again, as I mentioned, the one thing to be aware of is that if you do want to be backwards compatible, you have to pick um, either the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz space. So what you would basically then have if you chose the 5 gigahertz space, you would have a mixed 802.11a and n network. And if you chose the 2.4 gigahertz space, you would have a mixed 802.11b, g, and n network. Now the other thing to keep in mind when you're talking about having a mixed network like this is that the network itself will basically throttle back to the oldest or the slowest speed. So what that means is if you have one 802.11b device on an 802.11n network, the entire network will have to slow down and basically go back to the speeds of 802.11b. So a lot of people don't realize that they think as long as they have you know, an 802.11n access point that they'll get the full speeds of 802.11n and unfortunately that's not true you would have to have just a pure end network to really top out at those max speeds. So something to be aware of. Uh, there's also some nice technology built into 802.11n that allows for overcoming of interference. So um, what the protocol has done is it's actually uh, built in things so that your signal gets from its origin to its destination in a more reliable manner. Um, there's some kind of redundancy, pro redundancy specs that are built into it. Um, it has the ability to overcome multipath by using MODMO antennas, so it's just a little bit more of a reliable communication protocol. Now, some of the disadvantages, um, you know, there are there were a few draft versions, so you may have seen a draft N or a pre-N, and um, those were slightly different than the final 802.11n kind of ratified version. And so, if you have a device that is using some of those pre- or draft standards, you may experience some uh, communication issues when trying to communicate to a fully ratified N version. And that can get confusing because not everybody, you know, labels very clearly what version of 802.11n they're using. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it must be used in conjunction with another 802.11n product to really take advantage of and get the full speeds of 802.11n. So how does it do it? I mean, 802.11n is a really um, incredible technology. It's a great leap forward for Wi-Fi. Um, it uh, does it in a few different ways. So the first is that it uses what's called MIMO, or multiple in and multiple out technology. And what this does is it basically splits up the data into multiple what we call spatial streams. And um, the more streams you have, uh, the greater the bandwidth, because you're basically splitting your data into three pieces. So basically, if you have a two by two MIMO system, um, your data gets split into two, and you basically double your speed. Uh, if you have a three by three MIMO, it gets split into three data streams, and then you have triple your speed. Um, this does, however, require 802.11n on, on both sides, on both the sending and the receiving end, um, to take advantage of this technology. Another great leap forward was that um, 802.11n basically doubles the channel size. So if you remember back to the pictures that I showed you of 802.11b and G and A, uh, you had a certain um, channel that was allocated to, or excuse me, a certain amount of frequencies that were allocated to each channel. Um, in the older wireless technologies, they were 20 megahertz wide. In 802.11n, they're now doubled at 40 megahertz. And uh, you can think of this in a similar way uh, that water flows through a pipe. If you have a pipe that has a you know, small diameter, there's only a small volume of water that can flow through it. If you all of a sudden double the size of that pipe, there is a significantly higher volume of water that can now flow through that pipe at any given time. Um, and the data with 802.11n works the same way. Um, backward 802.11n, of course, is also backwards compatible, as I mentioned, with all three of the older Wi-Fi standards. And um, we have another poll question for you guys here. Uh, how familiar are you with Wi-Fi? So it looks like most of you from our first poll have used Wi-Fi to some degree, um, but uh, I'd like to know kind of how familiar you are with the technology. Um, our questions are very. I've used it at my home and also at work. Uh, somewhat, I kind of use it at home and I'm looking to go wireless at my, you know, at my work location or not at all. Um, I'm new to Wi-Fi and I don't really know too much about it yet. So it looks like our responses are coming through. It looks like most of you guys are pretty familiar with Wi-Fi, which is great. <clears throat> it's a wonderful protocol to use. And I'm um, going to give you guys just another second. And all right. 
So here's your results. 71% um, of you looks like uh, you've used it both at your home and at your work, so you're very familiar with Wi-Fi. And about 30% of you are using it at home um, and looking to go wireless at your place of business. Um, and it looks like none of you are totally new to Wi-Fi, which um, not totally unexpected given how prevalent wireless is pretty much in our everyday lives. So thanks for uh, sharing that with, excuse me, thanks for participating, guys. We'll have uh, one more uh, a little bit later on in our presentation. So now I'm going to move on very briefly to cellular technology. Of course, everybody nowadays has a cell phone, um, and uh, it's great because now that means that almost anywhere you go, not only in the U.S., um, but also in the world, you know, you're able to stay connected via your cell phone. Now, here in the U.S., we're a little bit different than other countries. Um, you know, there are basically two main types of cellular network standards here, um, and they're called CDMA and GSM. Uh, GSM is basically a global standard. It got started in Europe and um, is used by the majority of providers globally. So if you look at uh, total usage for cellular devices globally, um, cellular, or excuse me, GSM accounts for roughly 70% of uh, all total users globally. Now here in the U.S., both AT&T and T-Mobile use GSM-based networks. So for that reason, if you, you know, have a device that's you know, for one of those two networks, it's very easy for you to roam globally, whether that's up to Canada, whether that's to Europe, whether that's down to South America. Um, you know, those, those devices, because they're on a global, you know, on a global system, basically have the ability to you know, move between regions very seamlessly. And um, the vast majority of you know, GSM-based devices that are unlocked will work on any GSM network in the world. And um, most industrial communication devices that support cellular are going to be unlocked so that you can take those anywhere in the world without having to worry about you know, contacting a provider. You just basically get a new SIM card for them. In the U.S., um, the other very large standard that we have here is called CDMA, and um, this is a primarily a U.S. standard. It was developed here and is being adapted ba basically just by Verizon and Sprint. So if you use one of those two, and of course Verizon is the biggie here in the U.S., um, you, know, you are going to be operating on that CDMA network type. Now, the only downside with CDMA is that most devices will not work in other countries. So if you have a phone, um, like an older iPhone or you know, some other phone that operates on CDMA only, you will have a problem if you need to travel with that device overseas, um, unless that device has some sort of a GSM fallback to it, um, or like the newer iPhones, which may support you know, both technologies. Um, that, of course, would work globally. But if you have a device that's strictly CDMA, you are going to have a lot of troubles um, in getting that to different countries. So if you're looking to deploy cellular technology um, for your devices, uh, just be aware if you're staying here locally in the U.S., you can use either one. But if you have devices that you know you're going to ship overseas, then you probably want to look at using a GSM-based device. So what about LTE? Um, LTE, of course, is the latest and greatest. You know, you hear everywhere commercials. AT&T claims they have the best LTE. Verizon claims they have the best LTE. Um, really, this is kind of the wave of the future for cellular networks. And the reason for this is because, um, you know, consumers, as we put more and more devices with the you know, Internet of Things onto these cellular networks, um, you know, the need for increased bandwidth across those networks has definitely grown. And um, you know, GSM and CDMA, they're very reliable. They've been around for a long time, um, but they really lack the bandwidth needed to be able to get this many devices onto the air. Now, Wi-Fi, of course, is great in terms of bandwidth, but really lacks the kind of coverage that you need if you want to have a very wide um, type application or wide communication distance. So LTE was basically developed to provide the convergence of the bandwidth that was seen in Wi-Fi with the vast coverage of cellular networks. Now, the really nice thing about LTE is you know, you're no longer going to have to worry about, do I need a CDMA version? Do I need a GSM version? Uh, most LTE chipsets uh, support fallback to both older standards um, in terms of both GSM and CDMA, and um, support for both 2G and 3G versions of both of those. So LTE is really nice um, when it comes to that, because you're not having to worry about uh, you know, having a specific standard anymore. 
Now this chart basically shows you um, a couple different things. So the chart that you see on the top left is basically the convergence of those two different cellular standards. So the top row you'll see the GSM standards. Um, the 2G was what we called our GSM. Um, 2.5G was GPRS and EDGE. And the 3G um, typically is used as H HSPA. Uh, on the CDMA side, CDMA1 was considered to be their 2G technology, CMA2000 was considered 2.5G, and EVDO, um, which is still used in very, um, you know, very wide uh, areas here today, uh, was considered to be the CDMA 3G standard. And both of these, of course, as you can see, are converging into the LTE format. So LTE is really the true, uh, the first true total global standard um, where any device can work on any network around the world. Now when you're talking about cellular, it's, it is also important to note, you know, which generation is right for your application. So you have the options nowadays of having devices that operate on 2G networks, 3G networks, and 4G networks. And you know, you may always think, hey, I want the latest and greatest, and in a lot of circumstances that's the great way to go. Um, but the technology does cost a little bit more, and um, you don't always need the bandwidth that's available. So if you have an application that's you know, lower bandwidth, for example, if you have a serial-based communication that you need to put onto a TCP IP network, um, if you're just doing some I.O. monitoring, if you're doing something like uh, roadside sign changing, um, you know, all those things are very low bandwidth type applications, and so really don't require anything except for a 2G network. Now when we move up into 3G, um, things like Ethernet-based monitoring programming, so if any of you do remote programming of PLCs or HMIs, um, this is the type of uh, communication standard within cellular that you would want for that kind of remote communication. Um, snapshot monitoring, so not video monitoring because 3G isn't quite enough to do video over cellular, um, but snapshot monitoring, so if you have like a moving JPEG or something like that, that's very appropriate for you know, 3G as well. So when we talk into really needing the 4G or the LTE speeds, this is true you know, video monitoring. So if you have high resolution video, so for example a surveillance camera at a remote location that you need to constantly stream over a cellular connection, um, LTE would really be the, the way that you would want to go because you're going to need the bandwidth that's available with that communication technology. So uh, what are we seeing in the market today? Um, well, everything is going wireless. So you know we're seeing this thing, maybe you've heard of it, it's called the Internet of Things. And um, basically what the Internet of Things is, it's really the interconnection of all devices via the Internet. So you're going to start to see more and more devices be on the Internet, even things that traditionally in the past weren't. Uh, this includes things from both the industrial space, so you know, PLCs, HMIs, um, serial networks, all these things are being put onto the network. Uh, but even on the consumer side, as well. So things like your refrigerator, um, your car, your meter at home, um, you know, your washer and your dryer, all these things are basically put onto the network. And um, that's what's being called the Internet of Things. And um, you know, one of the big trends is how are we going to get everything to work together and make sure that there's enough bandwidth to have all of these devices on a network at any given time. So on the factory side, a lot of factories are trying to now become part of the Internet of Things. And so, you know, what we're really seeing is this interconnected system. So, you know, things all the way from the device or the sensor level all the way up to product development level, they all want to be on the same network and so they can all talk to someone, talk to each other um, and really have a very high efficiency. You know, there's no, there's no defects going on in a manufacturing line because if there is one, that gets sent immediately up to product development or into production so that they're aware of it and it can be stopped immediately. Um, it's not like the old days where if it, something happened on your production line, you'd have to hit you know, a stop button and then you'd have to run upstairs and tell somebody, hey, we're having a problem, please shut down this other area of the plant. Um, this you know, constant interconnection basically allows that communication to happen in real time right away. Um, and so you know, that's part of the industrial internet of things and that's what we're seeing in our industrial markets nowadays. Now this is an example of what a smart factory may look like. Um, you know, you can see here kind of the integration of all these different types of systems or all these different um, types of communications. So you know, you have things like your warehouse, which may have um, automatic AGVs um, or automatic guided vehicles, which are you know pack 
picking and placing. Um, you may have uh, sensors on each of the pallets or each of the boxes that are then used via Zigbee or some other personal area network um, to keep track of where they are at any given time. You have a data center, which is keeping track of all those devices that are moving through the warehouse. Um, you know, you have your production line, which of course, you know, is networked as well, so that if there are any issues with that production line, um, it can be flagged and addressed in real time. Um, and then the control center can monitor all of this. And so, you know, this is really that true interconnected or that smart factory of the future. And that's where we're really starting to see the trends go in the market space. Transportation automation, you know, this is something, um, transportation is actually really big in the Internet of Things because, you know, as more and more people get on the roads and we start to see more and more traffic, uh, more and more people battling for space on our freeways, on our streets, in our parking lots, um, it really makes uh, managing all that volume of traffic a lot more efficient by putting these things onto the network. You know, even things that you may not think of, like um, parking lots, are even being placed onto the Internet as well. So if you've ever driven up to a parking lot and seeing a big sign that indicates how many parking spots are still available within that lot, uh, chances are that number is being broadcast back to a control center so that they can monitor um, how full the, you know, the parking lot is and um, if needed can basically direct a flow, to traffic, flow of traffic to an alternate location if that starts to get too full. Another example of where we're seeing wireless everywhere um, is within uh, within within e-buses, and so you know we're getting to the point where people tend to be very security conscious. You know, unfortunately, we live in a day and age where crime happens, and um, you know people want to make sure that people who commit criminal acts can be prosecuted, and so a lot of people, especially on public transportation, are putting video surveillance um, onto their their buses, their trams, their subways, what have you. Um, the application is similar for all those communication methods. But um, what happens is you can then use wireless to basically broadcast that, um, you know, that, that, that video feed back. Um, and that can be, you know, via a connected uh, transportation network. It can be at a depot when buses come in at the end of the day. It can be at the stations they go to. Um, any of these locations can now be, you know, completely connected with a bus to, to bring that video back, um, either in real time or, you know, very close to being real time. Another market that's really started to embrace wireless is the oil and gas market. And, um, you know, this here is an example of a, a frack truck application um, where even the frack trucks are now connected. And, um, you know, what you have as an example um, is a local network using Wi-Fi uh, that is then connected back to the Internet at large with a cellular modem. And so this, again, kind of goes back to that convergence of the different types of cellular networks that we were talking about earlier in the presentation. Um, you know, we really start to see all these different wireless communication methods starting to kind of work together um, to create one very massive, very reliable network. Now, some of the challenges of wireless devices, um, you know, there are many. Uh, wireless, of course, is wireless. It's not as easy as plugging and playing into just a simple Ethernet network. But, um, you know, wireless has uh, the unfortunate, um, you know, downfall of being very susceptible to, you know, having interrupted operations. And these can come from many different things. Um, they can come from things like harsh environmental conditions where there's a lot of noise in the air. Um, it can cause, you know, it can be caused by communication interference like, you know, channel interference or other wireless networks in the area. Um, you know, sometimes there's a difficulty in migrating from wired to wireless just because of the bandwidth and some of the other protocols that may be running on a network um, as well as, you know, monitoring management. Um, if a device, for example, goes down, um, you don't have the ability to monitor it anymore with a wireless network. So there are many challenges, many unique challenges um, for, you know, reliable wireless communications. And um, with that, we've got another poll question for you guys before we go into some of these reliability issues. Um, for those of you who have used wireless, and this can be any wireless, not just Wi-Fi necessarily, but um, how many of you have actually had issues with wireless rel reliability? So our choices are, nope, my wireless has worked great, I have no complaints, um, some, but nothing that I couldn't really resolve. Um, and yes, unfortunately, I was never able to get my wireless working because of some of the issues that we've had um, in terms of reliability. So I'll give you guys a few more seconds here. It looks like most of you have had some uh, reliability issues, um, but not 
you know, so many that you couldn't uh, resolve them. So thanks guys for voting. Uh, here are your results. So as I mentioned, 79% of you looks like you had had some reliability issues, but nothing that you couldn't resolve, which is great. Um, obviously, we always like to see wireless get resolved if possible. 13% uh, of you um, said, yes, I've had a lot of reliability issues and I was never able to get wireless working. And um, the last percentage of you um, said, nope, my wireless has always worked great in the past. So thanks, guys, for uh, participating in our poll. So we're going to go into a few concerns about, you know, seamlessly enabling wireless transmissions in critical environments. So, you know, first off, we like to tell people, well, what exactly makes an industrial environment? Um, you know, there are many different definitions to it. Um, you know, here we typically define an industrial environment um, is, is an environment where a wireless network can be exposed to many different things. And these include things like power interference, um, magnetic field and emissions, also referred to as EMI, um, flammable gases, very extreme temperatures, whether that's in the oil fields of Saudi Arabia or, you know, the snow fields of Alaska, um, humidity and moisture. Uh, many industrial devices can also be completely water resistant. So if you have a washdown or an outdoor or environment. Um, that's typically considered to be very industrial as well. Um, there could be airborne particles or any kind of contaminants in the air that can get into your electrical devices. Um, and finally, there can also be a lot of shock and vibration, whether you're talking about um, communicating on a pick-and-place robot, an AGV, um, on a bus, on a train. All these things can be, you know, can expose devices located on them to very high levels of shock and vibration. So if you have an environment that has any of these things present, um, you're probably probably going to want to look at an industrial device rather than a consumer or an enterprise level device. Now one of the biggest issues that we've seen is actually a very slow uh, radio degradation over time. And so, you know, what happens is when there's a lot of um, there's a lot of noise in the air, um, that noise can basically come in through the antenna port and slowly damage the RF or the radio module inside of a radio at any given time. And, um, you know, it's basically just a slow chipping away of that device. And so, um, you know, you'll see your signal strength kind of slowly start to decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease some more until all of a sudden you go, oh my gosh, I have no more communication that's going on within my wireless device. How come? You know, there wasn't any, there wasn't any, you know, big lightning shock that got exposed to it. There wasn't any big jolts to it. There's no reason why all of a sudden it would start working. Um, and typically, you know, what, what we see when we see those types of um, situations is that there has been a lot of noise that's been present in the air. Um, and this is primarily occurring in industrial or open field environments um, or ones where there's, a, you know, where you're very close to a high voltage power source source, um, all these things can kind of slow, cause that slow degradation over time. And so one of the things that you want to look at is making sure that you have some sort of isolation built into your network, um, or excuse me, into your wireless device. Now, uh, some manufacturers will have isolation already built into their devices. Um, many of them will not, and so if you don't have that already built into your device, you definitely want to make sure that you're putting some sort of isolation um, in between you know, the antenna and uh, the input to the antenna into the system. The other type of isolation that's important to be aware of is actually power isolation. And um, again, there are some vendors who have power isolation built into their devices, some that do not. Um, but this basically protects against any kind of inrush current um, that's coming into the device that can damage the power module. And um, we see this a lot with, um, you know, devices, wireless devices that are connected to, um, you know, say uh, an AGV, for example, um, where there's also a motor and um, all the gr ground planes are tied together. When that motor then turns on, um, that inrush current comes into the system and can damage um, the, the wireless module if there is no power isolation that's already been put into that unit. So those are two types of things to definitely keep in mind um, because both of those can cause damage over time and it can be very hard to diagnose that kind of a problem. Um, but one of the best practices, of course, is to make sure that you have both power and um, RF isolation built into your system. 
The other one is extreme temperature and ingress protection. Um, ingress is also known as IP, and it's basically um, a degree of waterproofing. So there's also the NEMA standard, which is very similar to the IP standard. Um, but basically, you know, this allows devices to be present in any in in environmental condition. So um, if you have an IP68 rated, for example, this means that you can be actually submerged um, in water and still function normally. So, you know, if you have a washdown environment within a factory, so if you work in like food and beverage, um, or if you need communication outside um, where it may rain, um, having an IP68 rated device will make sure that um, that water will not damage any kind of circuitry inside of your wireless device. Shock and vibration are also a big one. Um, if you've ever, you know, plugged a standard RJ45 Ethernet port in, um, you know it's pretty easy to, you know, pull that out again. And so, you know, what we start to see in um, situations where there's a lot of vibration, that RJ45 port will actually vibrate out. And so one day, all of a sudden, it'll just disconnect itself. Um, so to address that, if you have a application that does have a lot of shock or a lot of vibration, you want to take a look at using a different type of connection. So an M12, which is basically a screw-in type of connector, um, or on the antenna ports, a QMA-style connector will help ensure that um, the vibration, the shock, doesn't accidentally disconnect uh, your wireless device. So there's a few things um, that we can take a look at to help increase the reliability. Um, you know, one is to have some sort of redundancy built into your network. And there are many ways of doing this. Um, you can have a hardware redundancy, you can have a network redundancy. Um, the one that's a little bit easier to scale is going to be something on the network redundancy level. So there are some devices that have proprietary redundancies built into them. Um, most devices will have a standard um, redundancy like RSTP or STP built into them, um, but enabling this on your wireless network will basically help to make sure that, um, you know, even if one of your links goes down, you still have the ability to bring your network back up automatically. Now, the amount of time that it takes to recover that network is going to be very dependent on the type of communication or redundancy standard that you use. So um, STP or RSTP, they tend to be the slowest, um, but they're also the most widely used. So you know, pretty much any vendor nowadays is going to have either RSTP or STP support on their, on their devices. So if you really want to go for um, compatibility with other devices, that's the redundancy that you're probably going to want to look at. Uh, if you're more concerned about having a very fast fail over time, then you're probably going to want to look at um, some more proprietary uh, redundancy standards. Also, if you have any kind of moving ap vehicle applications, um, whether this is um, an AGV inside of a, of a warehouse, uh, whether this is you know, a robot that moves around a factory, uh, whether it's a bus that moves through a depot, uh, all of these types of moving applications um, have the ability to what we call fast roam. And so you know, most wireless devices um, nowadays will support some sort of fast roaming. Um, there are both proprietary and um, upcoming uh, standards. Um, there is the 802.11 R, which is the Rome standard that was developed by IEEE. And um, what this basically does is it allows you to roam between access points uh, with very minimal time. So very similar to the way that when you're talking on your cell phone and you're driving down the street, you're hopping from cell tower to cell tower, uh, you don't know when that transition occurs. And so this fast roaming basically does the same thing, but on the wireless front. So if you have an application that is moving, um, you want to make sure that whatever devices you choose support some sort of fast or turbo roaming to make sure that you have that um, fast hand over time. Um, also, you know, size constraints. Uh, obviously, uh, many factories were built a long time ago. A lot of them didn't account for leaving space for, you know, communication equipment. And so, um, one of the things that you can do to help make sure that, you know, you're not having to totally redo your factory is to look for very small, um, you know, or, or devices that are designed with space constraints in mind. And one of the nice things about industrial products is that most of them are very conscious of the amount of space that's available to them. So you can find them in many different form factors. Some of them are the size of you know, cigarette packs. Some of them are long and narrow to fit onto DIN rails. Um, you can even find industrial communication devices that are rack mount if you so desire. Um, but the nice thing about uh, industrial products is that you, know, you do have the ability to fit into almost any kind of space. 
Um, so uh, we covered a lot of information um, today on our webinar, but uh, in summary, you know, when you're going to be looking at uh, implementing a new communication standard, the ones that are most popular on the market today are going to be Wi-Fi, uh, 900 megahertz, and cellular. Uh, of course, Wi-Fi is most widely used in local networks. 900 megahertz is most widely used in long distance or backhaul type networks, and cellular is used um, in you know very very wide on the global scale type networks. Um, you know, there are also many things that you can do to help make your connection more reliable and stable, um, whether that's making sure that you have inter uh, isolation protection built into your system, um, whether you have redundancy protocols, whether you have support for roaming. Um, all these things can basically help make your wireless connection a little bit more reliable and a little bit more stable. And with that, um, I'd like to say thank you very much. And it looks like we've got some uh, questions going coming in, so I'm going to turn it over to Marty, and he's going to uh, let us know what some of you guys are asking. Great. Thank you very much, Ariana. Uh, a ton of great information there. Um, we do have um, quite a few questions, so we'll try to get through most of them. I don't know uh, how much time we'll have um, uh, with the, the, you know, to answer these questions, but we'll get through as many as we can. The first one I have is from Steven. Um, he's asking about 802.11 AC. Uh, wants to know um, how prevalent it is in, in our industry or the industry in general and maybe also related to the industrial environments. Maybe you could you know, shed some light on 802.11 AC. Thanks, Marty. Um, great question. So, um, yeah, 802.11 AC is um, the latest standard that's you know coming out for Wi-Fi. Uh, we're seeing it start to become a lot more prevalent in the consumer market, but honestly, not so much in the industrial market. Um, for us here, we're the only place we're really seeing it is in the rail industry, where they're trying to stream very high volume of, of wireless, or excuse me, a video across wireless network, and so they need the bandwidth that's available for 802.11 AC. Um, we found that in an industrial environment, people tend to be a little bit more uh, hesitant to switch to the newest technologies because they're more concerned about reliability. So um, even 802.11n, believe it or not, is a lot less prevalent in the industrial space than you know, some of the older 802.11 standards. So the industrial market tends to be a little bit more conservative when it comes to adopting new technologies than the consumer or the enterprise space does. Great. Thanks, Ariana. Uh, second question comes from Brian. Uh, he asks, does the does LTE work with both GSM and CDMA? So maybe a little bit more info for Brian. Thanks, Marty, and uh, thanks, Brian. Oh, great question. Um, yes, it does. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, LTE is really the first one that's kind of a convergence of the two different cellular standards. Now, the one thing to be in, to keep in mind is that even though a lot of the LTE chipsets support fall back onto both types of network, you'll want to make sure that um, that's been enabled by uh, the vendor of the you know LTE device that you choose. So some may say you know they want to limit it to fall back to CDMA or fall back to GSM. Um, and there are some um, LTE modules that don't support fallback, but, but most of them do. So, um, you know, I think as LTE becomes even more predominant in the market, you'll start to see the quantity um, or the percentage of devices that support fallback into both, you know, continue to go up. Great. Thanks, Ariana. Uh, the next question uh, we have is from Chris. He asks, uh, is integrated isolation common amongst wireless devices? So I'll give it to you. Thanks, Marty. Um, great question. So, uh, yeah, I mean, some isolation is common. Um, power isolation tends to be seen in roughly 40% of industrial grade devices. Um, so, you know, you're going to be, it's going to be a lot easier for you to find a device that has power isolation on the market. Um, RF or radio isolation is very uncommon. Um, there are, you know, very few vendors that do have that built into their products. And so, if you have a situation where you need that kind of isolation, um, you'll either need to look at one of those vendors or um, putting in your own kind of external isolation. And that's not difficult to find, but it is just an additional component that would basically need to reside on your network. Thank you again. Um, looks like this next question comes from Juan. Uh, Juan, is uh, his question revolves around Zigbee. Um, and I believe you mentioned in your uh, presentation something about small areas. Maybe just touch on Zigbee again briefly. Um, and maybe make mention to uh, a little bit more clarification around what you meant by small areas. 
Um, yeah, thanks Juan, that's a great question. So um, Zigbee is going to have a really similar range to Bluetooth. Um, typically it'll top out at around 30 to 50 feet communication distance, so it's good for devices that are really used in kind of um, tight or, or densely densely packed environments. So if you have a lot of different sensors, um, so for example we see you know Zigbee used a lot in a water wastewater or in, in power meters where you know you have a lot of them that are in a densely populated area. Um, those types of applications are ones that Zigbee is going to be you know really useful for. Um, once you get beyond about 50, 60 feet, typically you're going to want to start to look at more of the Wi-Fi space because that tends to be um, you know tends to be a little bit more than what Zigbee can handle. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, next we have uh, Newton, who is uh, curious about the maximum bandwidth for 900 megahertz. So, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Newton. Great question. So um, this is kind of a little bit of a loaded question for 900 megahertz because it really depends on uh, what type of 900 megahertz system you're referring to. So um, it can be anywhere from you know kilobit level uh, for some of the the ones that have very small channel sizes, um, all the way up to you know potentially 54 megabits for some of the newer technology ones that kind of do um, frequency shifted Wi-Fi. So basically Wi-Fi over 900 megahertz. So there's a pretty broad range there depending on what type of device you're looking for um, and so you know typically if you have a specific bandwidth requirement that you need for 900 um, as long as you're kind of not exceeding that then you know typically you'll be able to find some sort of a solution on the market um, but do keep in mind that there are 900 megahertz installations are proprietary so you're gonna have to use the same vendor for both ends of your you know your 900 megahertz installation Great, thank you, Ariana. Uh, another question from uh, from Juan as well. Uh, uh, dim limitation distance. I mean, we just touched on 900 megahertz, but um, his question is on Wi-Fi. So, can you provide a little bit more insight onto the limitation distances for Wi-Fi? Yes, um, great question, Juan. So it, it's going to depend on which wireless protocol or which wireless standard you're using. So if you're using one of the 2.4 gigahertz protocols, um, those will typically go farther than uh, 5 gigahertz protocols. So um, for example, a typical consumer grade um, device, which typically has about a 30 milliwatt radio on it, um, when you're talking 2.4 gigahertz, um, you're going to top out at a max of uh, maybe 100 feet. Um, but if you're talking industrial grade devices, which typically have much more powerful radios, um, usually on the order of 200 or 250 milliwatts. Um, with higher powered antennas, you can typically go up to about 5 kilometers um, with Wi-Fi and 2.4 gigahertz. If you're talking 5 gigahertz, um, that is going to be shorter. Uh, typically, you'll top out, if you have a you know, pretty powerful radio and a very high gain antenna, the most you're really going to get with 5 gigahertz is like 1 to 3 kilometers, but that's definitely going to be pushing it. So the sweet spot for Wi-Fi is probably Probably upwards um, of you know uh, 50 feet all the way up to um, roughly a kilometer if you will and that's kind of really the sweet spot you can of course push it beyond that but it's going to be dependent on the environment that you have as well okay great uh, thank you Ariana uh, and the next question is from Juan and it, I th believe this will be um, you know our last question uh, we're, we're running out of time here but um, and then his question is, is focusing on the security of wireless um, maybe you can provide, you know, any insight into the protection that wireless offers, you know, against uh, threats, cybersecurity threats, things like that. This has been a great question for our la webinar last month, but we have it now, so you know, perhaps you can provide some insight there. Yes, yeah, certainly. So um, Wi-Fi actually does have some really good uh, security standards built into them. Um, it is, of course, up to the end user to make sure that those are implemented within their wireless network. But uh, there are basically three types of uh, security that you can use when talking about wireless. And those three are WEP, WPA, and WPA2. Uh, WEP is typically not used anymore. It's considered to be very, very insecure. Um, the key for WEP is actually broadcast in, um, you know, in, in without being encrypted or hidden. And so anyone who's doing any kind of sniffing across 
across your network can see that password very, very easily. Um, if you want something more secure, um, the best bet is to use WPA or WPA2. Um, WPA2 is the best. That's kind of the de facto standard nowadays. Um, and even within WPA2, there's two types of what we call authentication, and that's basically a way of proving you are who you say you are. So if you really want to have the, the best security against hackers, you're going to want to use what's called WPA2 Enterprise, um, which actually uses certificates to um, authenticate devices that are on the network. So what happens in that security um, in that security method is that you have a certificate that sits on every device you want to have accessing the network, um, and that certificate basically gets sent to a backend radius server. It takes a look, and if it matches what's on the server, the server sends a message to the access point that says, yeah, you know, yes, you can go ahead and allow this person on. So it's a lot more secure than just a password or a key to get onto a network because obviously that key can be shared amongst anybody. So that's going to be the kind of the most secure way of um, you know making sure that nobody who's unauthorized gets onto your wireless network. Great, thank you so much, Ariana. Um, so we're at the end of our session. You know, we've had a few more questions, and then we've had then we had time for. Uh, please know that we'll get those questions answered and respond separately via email. Uh, thank you again to Ariana. Thank you to everyone for your interest and participation. Just to let everyone know, you will, you'll be receiving a follow-up email with both the recording and presentation slide deck. Lastly, please take a minute uh, before logging off to fill out our survey, as we really value your input and feedback. Thanks again. Thanks again for tuning in, and have a great rest of the week.